Hi everybody. Today we'll be looking at the earliest period of American government, what we call the Federalist Era, from 1788 to 1800, and at the beginnings of the next epoch in our political history, known as the Early Republic, which stretches from 1800 to 1824. When George Washington, who we see again here, took office as the nation's first president, the number one task he faced was a straightforward but incredibly challenging one. He had to put the new federal government on the map, in a sense, to prove it was not a joke, that it was real, and that it could live up to the expectations created for it with the ratification of the Constitution. In some, he had to demonstrate that this new government could function, that it could enforce the laws, and have its powers respected by the states and citizens whose votes brought it into existence. He could not fail. To say that he felt some pressure, namely the weight of history upon his shoulders, is an understatement. The initial tests that faced President Washington were domestic ones. After the Revolutionary War, one of the primary goals was to secure the western frontier and pave the way for settlement. Even after the war was over, the British continued to agitate in the west by arming and funding Indian resistance efforts. This was especially true in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes, the area that made up the Northwest Territory. Washington, in his first term of office, as represented in this sketch, hoped to avoid violent conflict with the Western tribes. And to this end, he approved Congress's passage of what became known as the Indian Intercourse Act of 1790. It was an interesting piece of legislation. The first thing the new measure did was declare that the only sessions of Indian land that would be deemed valid and legally enforceable were those signed by Indians and ratified by the Congress of the United States. Neither private individuals nor the states could negotiate on their own with the tribes. The second part of the Indian Intercourse Act amounted to a marketing and propaganda campaign by the American government. Agents were sent out to meet with the Indians on the western frontier to offer trade goods and things like inoculation procedures against smallpox. The agents were also authorized to offer free education, food, and housing back in the nation's capital to select Indian children from the western tribes if their leaders wanted to send them. On one hand, the idea was to promote better, more peaceful relations with the Indians on the frontier. On the other hand, it was a way of cultivating a generation of spies and infiltrators into Native American societies. After all, if an Indian child taken by the federal government was schooled and raised to the age of 18 or so, taught English and indoctrinated with white Protestant Christian values, and then sent back to live among their own people, how much Indian would be left in them? Other than outward appearance, they would be more American than Indian. And of course, from the federal government's perspective, that was the whole idea. Although Washington hoped to promote peaceful relations with Indians, by his second term in office, the westward movement of settlers into the Ohio Valley, it started to trigger a military response from the tribes in the region, particularly the Ottawa and Shawnee. In 1794, Washington demonstrated that if tested, as we see him in this painting, he and the new federal government were more than willing and prepared to use force to remove Indians as a threat to the security of westward settlement. 
When the Ottawa and Shawnee escalated their attacks on forts in the valley late in the year, the president ordered the aptly named general, who we see in this sketch, Mad Anthony Wayne, to the region to crush the uprising. The encounter, which happened on August 20th, 1794, became known as the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Here we have another couple of sketches depicting Wayne leading his troops in what turned into a major victory of American forces over the Indians, who were scattered and demoralized by their defeat. The result of the conflict was the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, a moment captured in art many times over the years. Here are just a couple of examples that portrayed the negotiations. This map indicates what the Indians were forced to give up. Basically, all of what makes up the current boundaries of the state of Ohio and part of Indiana. The question of whether the federal government would and could protect the process of westward settlement, even in the face of Indian resistance, had been answered. Washington had passed his first major domestic test as president. Almost universally, the actions taken against the Indians won public approval. But Washington's next domestic challenge, which he met with equal vigor and aggressiveness, proved much more divisive among Americans of the time. Small farmers along the western frontier in states like Pennsylvania, had long been used to distilling their surplus rye, barley, wheat, corn, and fermented grain mixtures to make whiskey. In some places, whiskey even served as an accepted form of currency. Many of these whiskey-producing farmers were Revolutionary War veterans. They did not take kindly to a new tax on distilled liquors passed by the federal government as part of Alexander Hamilton's Assumption Plan in 1791. Hamilton wanted to use these funds to start paying down the war debts from the revolution, which the federal government had taken on from the states. The farmers, particularly those in western Pennsylvania, saw the tax as a violation of all they had fought against in the War for Independence, especially the idea of no taxation without local representation. They refused to pay the tax and organized themselves for resistance. For the next roughly three years, they protested, even as we see in this sketch, tarring and feathering tax collectors and parading them through the streets. When in July 1794, federal marshals were dispatched to Pennsylvania to serve writs on businesses that refused to pay the tax, some 500 rebels stormed the home of the tax inspector, General John Neville. In this sketch, we see the planning before the attack. And in this one, the invasion at Neville's house. The violence and resistance had spun too far out of control for President Washington to ignore any longer. The question was how would he respond to American citizens' protest against the powers of the new federal government? The answer, the same way he had to the Indians when peaceful negotiations broke down with overwhelming force. With the help of state governors, Washington assembled some 13,000 militia troops in western Pennsylvania to suppress the Whiskey Rebellion. He even went to review the men himself and sat for a famous painting at the time 
which we have here. Unlike in the Ohio Valley with the Indians, in western Pennsylvania, the rebels went home, prudently deciding that discretion was the better part of valor in this instance. So there would be no battle or violent confrontation. Winning, yet again, Washington had proved his own and the new federal government's mettle, though actually collecting the whiskey tax over time remained a difficult and highly imperfect business. Still, the open resistance and threatening of federal officials stopped. One final challenge remained for Washington, which proved, as it has for all succeeding presidents, much more difficult, if not impossible, to exert control over. This was the test of foreign policy. Washington had been president for less than three months when, on July 14, 1789, the famous storming of the Bastille occurred in Paris, ushering in the French Revolution. Here we have a couple of famous paintings of the event. The titanic upheaval in France presented a host of potential problems for Washington. First and foremost, the United States remained tied by formal treaty to France, according to the terms agreed upon for French aid in the American Revolution. If war were to break out with England now, which was not unlikely, France may call upon American aid. What would Washington do should such a scenario become a reality. No one relished, nor could the United States afford to be drawn into a general war in Europe, either directly or indirectly. Further, as the French Revolution turned into a violent crusade to bring down the entire aristocracy and all semblances of monarchical rule in the country, symbolized best by the notorious guillotine, illustrated in this painting. The exporting of political radicalism in the form of ideas alone became threatening. Many Federalist Party adherents like Hamilton became especially alarmed at the increasing bloodiness of the events in France. The Treasury Secretary's entire economic program and plans for the nation's future rested on the confidence and continued existence of a rich, propertied class in the United States. The last thing the party in power wanted to hear were chants of off with his head coming from the streets of American towns and cities. Anxiety within the Washington administration over the French Revolution became acute when what became known as the French Revolutionary Wars between England and France did break out, beginning in 1792. Jeffersonian Republicans tended to see what was happening across the Atlantic in France as a good thing, as a regrettably bloody, but necessary and historic display of Republican virtue, required to rid Europe of monarchism as a legitimate form of government. At first, Washington tried diplomatically to withdraw the United States from its treaty obligations to France, but the efforts were continuously rebuffed. This led Alexander Hamilton to craft a treaty proposal that was carried by John Jay, who we have in this sketch, to Great Britain. It resulted in what became known as Jay's Treaty of 1795. In it, the British agreed to withdraw completely from forts on the western frontier they had failed to vacate after the Treaty of Paris, which ended the revolution. They also agreed to peaceful trade with the United States, even as the wars with France continued. The Americans consented to turning the issue of outstanding debts owed to British creditors from the revolution and the restoration of loyalist estates over to arbitration. The proposed treaty angered France, 
as well as the Jeffersonian Republicans in Congress. They feared that closer economic and political ties with England would only serve to enhance the political and economic influence of Hamilton's Federalist Party, promote an American aristocracy, and undercut republicanism. Despite their opposition, the United States Senate approved the Jay Treaty by a two-thirds majority vote of 20 to 10, exactly the number required for ratification. It led to nearly 10 years of peaceful and productive trade between the U.S. and Great Britain, but it also served to deepen the divide between the political parties, the Federalists and Jeffersonian Republicans. Here we have an original copy of the Jay Treaty of 1795. One other event tied to the eruption in France became the concern of American leaders. This was the uprising of the slaves on the French island of Saint-Domingue in what we know today as the Haitian Revolution, depicted graphically in this famous painting. The revolt began in 1791 and would rage until 1804, when it finally ended in the first ever democratic republic in the history of the world, founded by slaves. Already worried about the export of radical political ideas from Paris, calling for the overthrow of all vestiges of aristocracy, now slaveholders in the United States, in particular, whether Federalist or Republican, had to worry themselves with thoughts about slave rebellion being exported from the Caribbean, much closer to home. They worried not only about slave revolt in places like Virginia and South Carolina, but also about the island becoming a refuge for escaping fugitive slaves. The northern free states already offered such a potential escape route, and slaveholders like Thomas Jefferson, for example, feared that now this island in the Caribbean might come to serve a similar purpose. In stark contrast to their enthusiasm for the French Revolution, most Jeffersonian Republicans did not approve of the events in Haiti. The foreign policy challenges he faced and the political divisions they generated internally convinced Washington in his famous farewell address, which we have a copy of here, to dedicate a major portion of his thoughts to the subject. Specifically, he warned future presidents to avoid being drawn into the political intrigues of European politics, as they inevitably, it seemed, led to catastrophic and costly wars, which the United States should do all it could to remain out of and neutral from. He considered it among the greatest challenges of leadership that his successors would have to face. And as things turned out, he was correct, not just at the time, but in relation to the entire history of American diplomacy, right up to our present. The scars of many violent struggles, including two world wars, stand as our evidence. When George Washington stepped down from the presidency, there's no doubt that Alexander Hamilton, the effective founder of the Federalist Party, would have loved to replace him. But Hamilton, born on the Caribbean island of Nevis in the British West Indies, was not eligible for the office. Instead, John Adams of Massachusetts, leader of the Continental Congresses and signer of the Declaration of Independence, diplomat to France during the Revolution, was the Federalist Party candidate for president in 1796. Here he is in a famous portrait painting. Adams narrowly defeated Thomas Jefferson that year to become the second president of the United States. He inherited from Washington a diplomatic situation fraught with pitfalls. 
and like him, he tried to peacefully end the country's treaty obligations to France. Sending an official delegation for that purpose within months of taking office in 1797. When the American diplomats arrived in France, they sought an audience with the French foreign minister, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord, who we have here. Before this could happen, they were met by three French officials who demanded loans and bribes, without which they suggested no meeting could be arranged. The American delegation was offended and outraged when their report of the events reached President Adams and was reported in the press. The American public was appalled as well. What became known as the XYZ affair, named after the anonymous French officials who demanded the bribes, turned into a major political scandal in the United States. Here's a famous political cartoon from the period that captured the drama. Federalists in Congress tried to turn the affair to their political advantage by accusing the Jeffersonian Republicans of supporting the corruption in France, even at the expense of American honor. Other countries, as shown in the cartoon, may be willing to engage in corruption to do business with the French, but the United States was not. The famous Federalist catchphrase of the time was, millions for defense, but not one red cent for tribute. Caught off guard by the scandal, Jeffersonian Republicans were put on the defensive. By 1798, the affair had escalated into a so-called quasi-war between the United States and France. The French Navy began stopping American merchant vessels on the high seas. After boarding the ships, the French kidnapped seamen in a practice that came to be known as impressment. When French agents were discovered in the United States, apparently researching the best ways to defend the Louisiana Territory in the event of a war in North America, President Adams and the Federalist Party responded by appropriating funds to expand the size of the American Navy. Jeffersonian Republicans, fearing the escalating tensions were spinning out of control, opposed this turn toward militarism. Up to this point in the crisis, the Federalists enjoyed the advantage. They already controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency in 1798. They were winning the public relations battle with Jeffersonian Republicans over the XYZ scandal and the quasi-war with France. But they pushed their luck and overreacted to their own paranoia over French intentions and capabilities in North America as well as to their Republican Party opponents. In July 1798, President Adams signed into law what were called the Alien and Sedition Acts. The alien part of the measure made it more difficult for immigrants to become American citizens by extending the residency requirement from five to 14 years. It also allowed the president to imprison or deport non-citizens considered dangerous, or from an enemy nation. The Sedition Act, which was much more controversial, since it represented a clear violation of the First Amendment, criminalized so-called false statements that criticized the federal government. It was viewed as a clear attempt to silence the Jeffersonian Republican opposition, and it succeeded not in securing the Federalist hold on power, but in jeopardizing it, as public opinion in the country began to turn against them. Suddenly, the Jeffersonian Republicans charge that the Federalist policies tended toward the aristocratic and even the tyrannical did not seem so ridiculous. This political cartoon from the time captures the essence of their response. 
and to a great extent public feeling on the issue. The Sedition Act is represented as a great serpent, determined to destroy free speech, a free press, and informed opinion. For their part, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were quick to respond to the passage of the Sedition Act. First in Kentucky at the end of November 1798, and then the following month in Virginia, resolutions were passed in both state legislatures in defiance of the Sedition Act. They became known as the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. Both were anonymously published. The public did not know, although many suspected, that Jefferson and Madison were behind the movements in Kentucky and Virginia. Here we have the cover of a later reprint that identified them as the authors. What the resolution stated is that when the federal government passed laws the states deemed unconstitutional, it was the right, if not the obligation, of the states not just to protest, but to nullify such laws within their borders, to refuse to follow unjust and unconstitutional measures imposed by the national government. It became known as the doctrine of state nullification, and it would resurface again in the history of American politics. As the election of 1800 approached, things did not look good for John Adams' re-election prospects. Still, at the end of 1799, he succeeded where his predecessor, George Washington, had failed. Adams finally was able to secure a formal diplomatic end to the United States Treaty with France. He benefited from timing. In a November 1799 coup, Napoleon Bonaparte seized power, effectively putting an end to the French Revolution. Here we see him in a famous portrait painting from his days as First Consul of France, before he declared himself Emperor. Napoleon desired a stable relationship with the U.S. because he hoped to use the Louisiana Territory as a base from which to supply the French colonies in the Caribbean islands. Despite the diplomatic success, Adams' political prospects did not improve enough to secure him a second term in office. In the election of 1800, he narrowly lost to Thomas Jefferson. Significantly, with Adams' defeat, for the first time, a different political party and set of interests came to power. Rather than the Federalist strong central government philosophy, Americans at the outset of the 19th century would get their first look at the Jeffersonian Republican ideology of limited government in action. The widespread violence and chaos that many feared in the event of a Jeffersonian Republican victory in 1800 did not on the whole come to pass, despite some isolated incidents in cities like Baltimore leading up to the election. The revolution of 1800 really lay in a change in the priorities of the federal government, in the move from an administration and party focused on advancing federal power and the size of the military, for example, to one determined to employ an ideology of small government and that feared standing armies as a threat to individual liberty. Here we have the famous portrait painting of Jefferson done after he took office. One of the first things Jefferson did as president was order a downsizing of the country's naval forces. It was a move he would later come to regret. He also cut taxes, among them the hated whiskey tax that was part of Hamilton's program for paying off the national debt. Beyond this, Jefferson got rid of many bureaucratic jobs within the executive branch 
thus fulfilling his promise to literally shrink the size of the government. One of the things the Jeffersonian Republicans were known for by this point is what we still refer to as strict construction of the Constitution of the United States. This means a literal interpretation, especially the part of the Charter that declares all powers not explicitly designated to the federal government be reserved to the states individually. This is why it's so ironic that the one thing Jefferson is most renowned for in his first term is an event in which he completely ignored the dictum of states' rights philosophy or any kind of strict construction of the Constitution. This, of course, was the famous Louisiana Purchase of 1803. What started as a simple attempt to purchase the port at New Orleans, desired in order to provide unfettered access along the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico, turned into a counteroffer by Napoleon, which offered to the United States all of Louisiana for the price of 15 million, in today's money the equivalent of a little over 300 million dollars. The Constitution authorized the president to engage in no such transaction. But Jefferson did not blink. One look at a map of what the purchase entailed shows why he and other American leaders of the time, not to mention average citizens, swallowed any scruples they may have had about constitutional interpretations. The Louisiana Territory encompassed 530 million acres of land, about 827,000 square miles, and instantly doubled the size of the United States. Napoleon, for his part, was willing to sell because his attempt to reinstate slavery in Haiti had failed by 1803, meaning the idea of using Louisiana as a base for supplying the Caribbean islands had become less relevant for him. More pressing by this point was his need for money to fund what became known as the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. His attempt to subdue and unify the entire continent under his rule. Just like Adams before him, Jefferson benefited from perfect timing and his negotiations with the French dictator. It turned out to be the single greatest achievement of Jefferson's entire eight years in office, and it led directly to a project that delighted and interested the president greatly, the famous Lewis and Clark expedition, also known as the journey of the core of discovery. Here we have Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, the leaders of the expedition, together with Clark on the right and Lewis on the left. Lewis was a close friend and confidant of the president, and Clark was a close friend of Lewis. Toward the end of 1803, they set out from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, on a journey that would eventually take them all the way to Oregon and the Pacific Coast. The government-sanctioned expedition had many objectives, the most important of which tends to be least remembered or emphasized today. The mission's immediate purpose was to explore and map the region and try to establish a reliable western route across the continent to the Pacific Coast. Jefferson's scientific interests also turned the journey into a nature expedition with Lewis and Clark expected to document all new forms of plant and animal life found along the way. The region was so unknown to many Americans that some imagined woolly mammoths possibly still roaming across the Great Plains. Of course, they did not find any, but they did encounter creatures like grizzly bears, whose enormous size terrified and fascinated the members of the expedition. Another expedition, or objective I should say, was to try and open trade talks with willing Indian tribes in the Western Territory. 
A little over a year into the expedition in November 1804, the expedition met a French trader, Toussaint Carboneau, and his at the time pregnant Indian wife, a Shoshone woman named Sacagawea. She was invited to join the expedition as an interpreter and gave birth to a son, Jean Baptiste, shortly after. Here we have a couple of illustrations of Sacagawea. The first with her husband, and the second one with Lewis and Clark. She was not the expedition's guide, as is often suggested, but her presence, along with that of her infant son, reassured many tribes along the expedition's route of Lewis and Clark's peaceful intentions and helped them avoid any violent confrontations with the Indians, despite a frightening run-in with the Teton Sioux in present-day South Dakota. The peaceful front of the expedition masked an insidious hidden agenda, however, if viewed from the Indians' perspective. The most important part of the mission was to conduct a reconnaissance survey of the Indians that occupied the lands Lewis and Clark traveled through. The federal government needed to know what tribes were out there, how populous they were, whether they were peaceful or warlike, and how open to trade they were. In other words, Jefferson and Congress needed to know what was required to subdue the new lands they had acquired and start to bring them, not in theory, but literally under the sovereignty of the United States. This was the most valuable information Lewis and Clark returned with in 1806 after a more than two year adventure. There was one more thing that mattered when it came to the Louisiana Purchase. This photograph tells the story a seemingly never-ending field of cotton. In 1794, Eli Whitney showed how to make cotton pay with his invention known as the cotton gin. We have an example of an original cotton gin here. It took a human being, usually enslaved, many long hours of labor to separate the cotton seeds from the fiber, which was necessary to bundle, pack, and ship it to textile factories, both in the northern United States and overseas. With the cotton gin, the cotton was simply fed into the device. A crank was turned that fed it through a series of rotating teeth, and the seeds were separated from the fiber, which came out the other side ready to stuff into 100-pound sacks, ready for shipping. Over time, as we can see in this sketch, massive industrial-sized cotton gins were created. These machines turned the hundreds of pounds of cotton slaves could produce on a large plantation in a day into many thousands of pounds, and with them exorbitant profits to cotton planters. And as it fatefully turned out, another group that was soon to see an explosion in numbers, slave traders. The combination of the cotton gin and the acquisition of more territory in the West with the Louisiana Purchase, as we see indicated in these couple of sketches, guaranteed that slavery was not an institution that would ever slowly fade away. Instead, it underwent a dramatic period of growth over the first half of the 19th century, expanding to the Southwest into what would become known as the Cotton Kingdom of the South. Jefferson's other notable actions as president included a decision not to recognize Haitian independence when it was finally achieved in 1804. His reasons were the fear of slave rebellion spreading to the United States, as almost happened in his native Virginia in 1800 with what became known as Gabriel's Rebellion. 
a potentially large uprising that failed to get past the conspiracy stage before being exposed. But the next one might succeed, and inspiring stories from Haiti to slaves in places like Virginia were greatly feared. Jefferson and other slave owners also worried about the island becoming a refuge for runaways. Not until 1862 did the U.S. recognize the independence of Haiti when it was engaged in its own civil war to eradicate slavery. Jefferson's much bigger foreign policy challenge was the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe and the worsening problem of impressment of American sailors that resulted from the ongoing chaos across the Atlantic. At this point, both France and Great Britain were engaging in the practice in an ongoing effort to keep their naval forces fully manned, although England ultimately proved to be the bigger violator of American neutral rights on the high seas. Here we have some sketches of the practice of impressment created by artists of the time. President Jefferson's problem was that he had limited options for dealing with the crisis, and it was his own fault. At first, Jefferson tried diplomacy, then a boycott of European goods into the United States. When this failed, he opted for a full embargo in 1807, a virtual shutdown of all imports from Europe and all exports from the United States. The economy, merchants, and businesses all suffered. It was not a popular policy. The reason Jefferson had to opt for an embargo was because he himself had taken a military option off the table when he decided to shrink the country's naval forces as part of his limited small government philosophy. The humiliation of impressment and the unpopularity of the embargo were problems that remained ongoing when Jefferson left office in early 1809. One final historic event occurred before Jefferson left the White House. As part of the compromises over slavery that led to the ratification of the Constitution, the slave trade from Africa was kept open and legal for 20 years, but that time was about to expire in 1808. Jefferson recommended to Congress, and it agreed, to ban the traffic, to outlaw it when the statute ran out. It may seem strange that Jefferson, a slaveholder, and members of Congress, many of them slaveholders also, would elect to end the slave trade. So why did they do it? It was not out of benevolence. The fact was that the geography and economy of slavery was changing in the United States by the early years of the 19th century. Part of it we've already alluded to with cotton, the cotton gin, and how both led to a dramatic growth in slavery and ongoing demand for slaves. So clearly, ending the trade from Africa had nothing to do with slavery being a dying or fading institution. What happened was that in the parts of the United States where slavery had existed the longest, the Chesapeake region of Virginia and Maryland, tobacco country, the soil was depleted and no longer good for tobacco in many places. As a result, many Chesapeake planters over the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century shifted to wheat production. This was significant because wheat was much less labor intensive than tobacco, which meant it required fewer laborers to produce. By the early 1800s, both Virginia and Maryland were sitting on sizable 
surplus slave populations, owning more than they could gainfully employ. Rather than free them, planters like Jefferson saw an opportunity for profit by selling off their surplus property to planters in the emerging cotton-producing states of the South, places like Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. The reason the United States ended the slave trade from Africa was because it saw the opportunity to establish a homegrown, domestic traffic that could make white men rich. Historians call this the beginnings of a second Middle Passage. Instead of from Africa to America, from the Upper South to the Lower South. Instead of across the Atlantic Ocean, along the Mississippi. A horror recognized in the phrase of the day, sold down the river. Over the next half century or so, some half a million individuals made the journey into hell. Separated in most cases forever from families and loved ones. For the first time, Americans traveling along the country's dirt roads might stumble across the site captured in our final sketch, a slave coffle. Hundreds of human beings chained together, being moved by slave traders to market. All right, so that does it for today. Next time we'll look at the administrations of James Madison and James Monroe, the last in the early Virginia dynasty of presidents in the War of 1812, sometimes called the Second War of American Independence.